Hancock, New York, rescuing residents. Similar scenes were repeated from there all the way to New York. Flood watches have been issued for Delaware County. When it starts to rain, she always looks out her window to make sure the creek doesn't crest. The stuff that means your childhood memory where you picked raspberries and strawberries, you never can get that back. This is almost at the beginning of the headwaters. We did rip rap a little bit right there on the flood. But it's just the stream just kept digging and churning and inciting itself and then all the dead load gets sent down to Kadosha Creek where it's meeting Snake Creek and Kadosha meet of the T. Mm -hmm. Kadosha Creek carries the dead load as far as it can and then uh, the Delaware River it was at flood stage in both those events. 2006 it was in flood stage before these tributaries even had a chance to get all the dead load down there. And then it just got deposited uh, on the flat in lower Kadosha and mm -hmm. well you can see it out in the uh, the mouth of Kadosha Creek in the Delaware River. We're destroying everything we do down there if this these kind of things don't get addressed yeah. too. Then it starts getting on the bedrock so the stream can't go any deeper there. It's either going to go in the bank or it's going to go into our road. And we just play the game of getting our gravel out of the stream down below and bring it back up here and build the road out of it and do it again in the next storm and the next storm and the next storm. So we got pretty good at it. <laughs> Some of those trees that are hanging there, and when one of them falls and gets carried away, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you that that tree's probably not going to fit through a three foot pipe, yeah. you know? It's just uh, it's chasing your tail. It really is. We just keep sending the problem further down and down and down and down and down until eventually it's, it's going to be somebody else's problem. It's time to have some science involved. Right. And I know one recommendation was get out of here. Don't right. even be here. Right. It doesn't make sense. That's all fine and dandy. We just need time. And Who recommended that? Mark Land Studies. We're way up above where all the action's happening, where all the concern is. Are potential storage and volume areas for events, okay. storm events, and I think that's one of the things that would be really interesting to quantify. Symptoms, problems, what we've got here is a natural system that is in the headwaters of the watershed, and the headwaters is really where you want to start. The way that the trick is right now I think is what Don called a reference area. So there's a gravel base to this that we're seeing here. Look at, look at what we got. We've got root systems of herbaceous material, um, willows. Look at the shade under here, a little hole way back here. I mean, that's where the fish are gonna be. Right. They're gonna be in that shade, it doesn't matter how, how hot the sun is. To close the canopy, the canopy is a small canopy. Insects uh, would drop in here, terrestrials. Uh, so that's just a, a point of reference. Just having a picture of this to me is, um, is a big deal. Now we're in, I mean, look at, I mean, uh, this is mucky stuff. Something's holding the, the sediment back. So that cobble and gravel is now being replaced by look at look at what's coming up here as I'm walking. It's just you know it's just a sediment plume coming off the bottom. Typically, you dam up the water and you you capture it so that it'll run down a race, and that's where you would put some type of wheel that would cut timber probably here. That's probably what this was. You're gonna see now whole different system. Remember, anything behind that dam got trapped up there, so it's hungry coming out of that area. And as we're moving down, there's a lot more of the watershed feeding into it. And the more times it goes to these banks, it, it exponentially increases the sediment load. The stream cannot move this material. 
So what happens is the channel moves and it goes up against the valley wall. You get a lot of sediments bleeding out of the bank. Now we're getting down cutting. Instead of having to go a foot, now it's, I mean, what is that, three and a half? I don't know what happened, but something's, something's a little different here. But now we're in the throat. Everybody's down in the, in the throat. Oh, we gotta fix it. It's over here, put the rocks over here. Look up on that bend, straight up the bend where the creek is. You start making a turn around there. There used to be two trailers in there. And they were purchased during the flood buyout program. The town, we've spent, we spent 1.1 million on Kenosha. Just Kenosha. Probably be 1.7 or 8 million when we're done. Sea piling well was a corrective action to the 1996 flood. Still jumped behind where the wall starts and got in there anyway. Well, I don't know, you walk through this whole corridor and you see all of the issues that are facing everybody. You know, I think that's it, why everybody's so receptive to Hudar coming up with the $50,000 to do the study. They know that it's just not getting in there and dig anymore, that there's got to be some science involved. The stream banks that are looking all nasty and littered with invasive species are just playing gravel like down there. I mean, that's it's just nasty looking. So the residents have seen you know, a lot of attempts to fix this in the past, different yeah. floods, and they're ready to, they're receptive to something new, yeah. you know, some new ideas. Back in the day, they say, uh, before my time, but the state used to just start at the bottom and work all the way through here with a steam shovel and dig in. You still have the generation that wants to see that done. Eventually, the, I'd like to see the dead load stop or slow down a little bit so we don't have to do that type of thing. But the money's just starting to trickle in for the study. We're three years later. It's almost like a dam, basically. Right. You got the highway and you got well, three what, small holes there. That's what happened, that plugged up on your floor. Yeah, it's a dam. Yep. And, and so, but during high flows, as you know, it probably shoots out of there like a fire hose. We're entering the town. We're at the upper limits, I guess, of the Kadosha area, standing on a bridge that was replaced as a result of uh, some of the massive damage occurred during some of the flooding. So what you can see here is uh, you know, more of a, a traditional stabilization approach. You've got your mountain, you've got your uh, flat or your terrace and floodplain. And the differential between the two here is, is a good 15 feet. And um, that becomes problematic for your floodplain stability of the floodplain in these areas wants to be a lot wider and it's, it's getting very uh, in size, um, tightened, and it really creates a lot of an engineering term of shear stress on the channel. And that's how I've really down touched the channel and it really doesn't have a lot of space to go. And so it's going to push laterally and it's going to push vertically down and that really rips apart whatever's in its way. Really, some of the things that we looked at earlier up in the watershed um, are really the place where you want to uh, solve a problem. You're down here with a symptom of a problem where all the water has come already and it's going through a small orifice. If you look downstream as well, you know, you really don't have a lot of space for that a volume of water to go. And that becomes a real big consequence of, uh, of really living within the floodplain. Where do you put your resources? In the symptom or the problem? There's so many mouths on this river that had domes of five, seven feet of, of material of that size, and that's not the problem. The problem is why is it there? Where did it come from? Mm -hmm. How can we prevent that from happening again? Move up in the watershed and you know what? The answer is right in front of our noses. 